Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, looks like we're about to get started. It's exactly one o'clock on the nose. Hopefully, the online audience can hear me. Hi to everybody out there. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being here um, for this, I think, is going to be an amazing talk. Uh, my name is Melanie Day. I work for CDFW out of the Bay Delta Region office in the HabCon unit. Um, pretty good participation today. I know there's a lot of people in our online audience and there's a pretty good crowd here. So thanks again for making it out here. Um, we're very pleased that we have Greg Tatarian here to talk to us and to share his wealth of expertise and knowledge about the different bat populations of California. Um, so thank you very much for being here and taking some time to do this for us. So, and also uh, I wanted to thank um, the Bay Delta region, which I work for, and also the Habitat Conservation Planning Branch for providing input and review on this presentation and really encouraging us to do it um, and to make time to get it done, um, even though Greg did most of the work. <laughs> Um, we were able to still, you know, facilitate it and to, to set it up. And also, thank you very much to um, the Department of Tech DTD, <laughs> the technological folks, and also to Annie Ching, who is the person who heads this whole thing and has helped organize everything today. So thank you. It takes the village to make these things happen. Um, I do want to say a little note on the title of the presentation. So um, the title of the presentation, as you can see on the screen, is a little different than advertised, so sorry about that. But the new title does capture what was advertised, <laughs> so it's, you can't completely call it false advertising. <laughs> um, so the reason we changed it from conserving California bats through, uh, I think we had LSA, Lake and Stream Alteration Agreements, and CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, we changed it to through environmental review and printing. The reason for that is because after we already advertised, we got feedback from important people <laughs> that we should make it a little bit more encompassing. So however, the, the presentation still touches on LSA and CEQA. Um, and I think the main thing that the presentation does is, you know, uh, Greg, he's, he knows about the regulations and CESA, or sorry, CEQA and LSA, but he's a true bat expert. That's his wheelhouse. Um, so really understanding the ecology of the species, how to detect them, uh, what kind of habitats they live in, and how to avoid and minimize impacts, those are the ways that you're going to be able to, for at least for CDFW staff and consultants, um, to write and prepare good LSA notifications and agreements, and also to write good CEQA documents. But we do get a little bit, particularly into CEQA, about certain strategies for doing that. Um, let's see what else I was going to say. So do you want to say that after the, so we'll ha of course we'll have a Q&A se uh, session. It's going to be after uh, Greg is finished with his talk, and then we'll open it up for questions. And Annie will walk around with a microphone, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and she'll find you. Just know that our online audience can only hear you um, and hear Greg if you're talking into a microphone. So just wait until you get the microphone and then say your question, and then you get to have a microphone, which is kind of fun. I think. <laughs> um, okay, so that's pretty much it for that. I'm going to go a little bit into Greg's background and then Greg will get rolling. So Greg um, is the owner of the wildlife... <laughs> well, it's my surrogate bat. So. Oh, okay. Of Wildlife Research Associates since 1991. Um, he's a bat specialist consultant, as I'm sure a lot of you are already aware. And he does surveys and has done lots of surveys, assessments, developed avoidance and minimization measures, mitigation design, and done a lot of bat research. Greg has a scientific collecting permit with authorizations for bat research, including uh, capture, marking, tissue sampling, and radio telemetry. He's done surveys of a bazillion buildings and bridges. <laughs> He's done humane eviction, humane, the right way, of over 250 buildings, many miles of bridges and culverts. He's done a lot of work with uh, Pallid Bat and Townsend's Big Art, Big Air Bat, which as you guys know, are special status bats. Um, I think this is really cool. He was the first person in California to design and build a successful Pallid Bat maternity roost. And that was in 1995. 
He has had many successful designs of bat houses and on and in structure replacement bridge roost habitats, and he's won awards for that. He's also published, um, he's published observations, designs in Bat Research News, Bat Conservation International, and others. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, Greg is the co-author co of the 2004 Caltrans Bat Mitigation Measure Report, um, California Bat Conservation Plan for the Department of Fish and Wildlife, which is in preparation. You know, he's been working along that for a long time. <laughs> And uh, he's also the author, which I think is part of that report, right, of bats in anthropogenic roosts. Yes, that's actually, uh, yes, yep. that's my chapter. Yeah, <laughs> that's the chapter. So without further ado, here is Greg Tatarian. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming. And for those who are online, I wish you could be here. Uh, hopefully, um, we have... <coughs> Uh, a good mix. I know that here in the audience we have largely agency folks, but online we may have perhaps a mix of agency people as well as consultants. And my aim is to speak uh, to both of you, uh, groups of people, about the things that I have learned over the years that I've been working with bats in, in this arena. <clears throat> First, I want to say thank you very much to Melanie Day, who really spearheaded this from my perspective. Um, it is something that I had offered to do uh, for a number of years to other uh, Cal Fish and Wildlife staff, and Melanie had the energy and the desire and the ability to make it all happen, uh, and I really do appreciate that as, as well. Uh, managers within the department who gave their valuable feedback and help guide this and propel it to where it is. I think this information is going to be useful to uh, particularly those who have to either review uh, recommendations or reports or those who have to write them. And thank you all for joining us here today and online. So I have some uh, basic goals that kind of came to the forefront as we were developing the, the material for this presentation. And for those of you that are already very familiar with bats or are, you know, straight on bat biologists, this is all going to be um, very rudimentary. But what I'm trying to do is make sure that those that are not quite caught up understand the building blocks. And that's what I want to do throughout this talk is give you building blocks. So I'm going to move you from point A all the way to point Z. So for those people who really don't have a strong foundation and an understanding of basic bat biology, basic bat roosting ecology, I'm going to be talking about that because that shapes and forms the methods and approaches that I've been using and I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, we're going to talk about, as, as Melanie said, this isn't just uh, strictly CEQA LSA focused, but primarily it is. But I'm also going to show you uh, some examples of other laws and regulations that help protect bats later on. And so all of this is going to go to, to provide some practical roosting ecology driven strategies for you. Hopefully try to simplify what is really a very complex taxa. <clears throat> so let's start with why are we even concerned? Uh, the fact is that, you know, bats are um, non-game mammal. Uh, they are protected under a variety of, of uh, laws and regulations, and they're protected as non-game mammals. Uh, there's many other reasons why we are concerned about the populations of bats, and we only have so much time, so I'm really going to be hitting highlights. And one of the things that kind of drives a lot of the urgency that many of those of us that work with bats is population decline. I'm not providing you with a whole string of references. You can go anywhere online and find a, a plethora of information about all the causation for declines of bats. I will be talking about uh, some of the most critical ones because they relate to how we deal with bats through the regulatory process. So we also want to kind of separate out what we talk about when we're talking about uh, population decline and reasons for those declines. There are different impacts, by the way, uh, regionally and locally. So for example, 
in Southern California, what we'd be considered to be a, a ubiquitous or common bat, I don't like to use that term, and I'll explain why later, uh, Epteskis fuscus is in great trouble in uh, highly urbanized areas. Antrozoas pallidus, pallid bat, uh, another species that is, is in big trouble in certain parts of Southern California. Maybe doing quite well and more stable in other parts of the state. Uh, so there, it is not uniform across the state wherever a species occurs. Its distribution uh, will be different across the state, and the pressures on that, dis on that population, those different populations, will be different. So we also want to be thinking about the types of impacts. So we, most of us that work with bats, consider bats to be roost limited. And that's not to say that if there's no foraging habitat, bats can still live as long as they have a roost. But some bats can fly and do very long distances to foraging habitat, it is not as limiting as having no place to live. Uh, so those can cause both direct and indirect impacts. If there's no place to live, if there's no roosting habitat, that eventually will, will reduce populations. They simply have nowhere to live. But the cause of that loss of roost habitat can actually result in direct mortality, which we'll talk about. Whereas loss of foraging habitat, uh, we tend to think of that more as indirect impacts. It just causes the species to wink out in an area. Oops. Sorry. So here's some of the direct mortality causes that we can easily identify. And I have been hearing from some friends and colleagues of mine in Southern California who informed me that illegal pest control in their area is still continuing, still more prominent than it is in areas that I work, which is distressing and a little bit surprising to me. By illegal pest control, I'm referring to the illegal application of pesticides for use on bats. There are no legal pesticides for use on bats. In California, improper pest control still occurs, and that's widespread. And that's simply uninformed or uncaring pest control operators who are not really qualified to do the work. And they may do something like trap a whole colony of bats inside by sealing up the building without first getting the bats out. Pesticides in agriculture, that's really being kind of looked at. We don't know, we don't know how to quantify that exactly, but that is something that we're concerned about, the direct application of pesticides and how that may cause direct mortality. Roost vandalism, that's something that I do deal with for, uh, fairly often, and that is obvious. If uh, a roost is vandalized while bats are present, or the roost is damaged or destroyed, even when bats are not present, uh, that can result in direct mortality. Mine closures, that's something that's been, that we've been aware of for a long time, and a lot of effort has been spent to try to minimize the potential take of bats uh, during <clears throat> mine closures. Destruction of roosts, you, you kind of get the theme here, is, is really where we tend to find a lot of the mortality occurrences for, for bats. Having said that, up until, you know, fairly recently, uh, maybe 10 years, those were the things that we were the most concerned with, and we weren't as concerned about disease. White-nose syndrome has really taken its toll on many species, uh, many populations of bats, and it's marching west. It's something we're very, very concerned with. Um, I didn't mention, you know, impacts from wind uh, generators, and that is uh, something that is continuing to be a problem, but is also continuing to be researched. You're going to find that, that the, the agency management opportunities there in Red Ink, you'll find a little continuity here. There are, throughout my talk in this, um, in different slides, you will see red asterisks or red lettering that um, I'm going to use as triggers for you folks that are in, in agencies or in the department. These are things that I want you to kind of think about in this context, that these are places that serve as triggers, perhaps, for agency involvement. All of these things are agency management opportunities. I want to give you an example of how just encroachment, urban development, um, can cause the loss of a, of, of a species and perhaps even direct mortality. In this case, we don't really believe so, but we don't know. And um, this is a photograph, a Google Earth image from about 1977 of a Townsend's big-eared roost that I found in Mountain View some years back, a few years back. Uh, this was actually a, um, 
kind of a remnant uh, urban agriculture greenhouse operation. Uh, and this is what the surrounding landscape looked like. You'll see to the southwest, there's a riparian uh, strip. Immediately to the east, there's a long riparian strip. And fast forward about 20 years, and you see how urban development has really begun to fill in almost all of the landscape. We still have the riparian area, and there's still a little bit, you can see that red star there, there's still a little bit of quasi-open space immediately to the east of that. And this is what it looked like in this year. <clears throat> so you can pretty much see that really the only open space is that kind of grassland and spotty woodland to the east and some little parkland, oakland to uh, the west and then the riparian strips. Well, for Townsend's bigger bat, that isn't sufficient. That's not sufficient to live. And certainly by the time this greenhouse, these greenhouses were taken away, that was all she wrote. So this is a great graphic example of how urban development takes its toll. And this is really why we have CEQA, why we have lake and stream bed alteration permits, and why we really need to be thinking in terms of the entire taxa of bats when we are looking at uh, conserving them through the regulatory process. So I said I was going to give you building blocks. Those of you that already know this stuff, bear with me but it's important to understand a little bit of bat biology to kind of get the context, and then I'll get more deeply into roosting ecology. That's super important. Uh, bats belong to the order Choroptera. It means it's Greek for hand wing, and you can clearly see the resemblance to my own hand. The wing is uh, very much like our own hands with long, elongated finger bones, that thumb that is sticking up in the air, and the order is split into two suborders. We happen to have uh, microcoroptera here in, in California and North America um, in this hemisphere. There are about 1,300 species worldwide. There have been new species discovered and species that have split genetically and so forth. We have about 45 species in North America and about 25, we say about because that's our volant and fly around, 25 species that we know to be in California. Now, most everybody knows by now, based on some groundbreaking work that was done in the 50s, um, that bats echolocate. They're one of relatively few groups of wildlife taxa that actually echolocate, but they really do use it to their great advantage. Not all bat species do, but pretty much all of our bats that we have in California use, use echolocation to greater or lesser extent. What, one th very interesting thing, and this is, should have had a, a red asterisk by it because I want you to be thinking about the implications of a very small animal that lives a very long time. 25 to, or 20 years to 41 years, I think, is the record now. That's a very, very long time for an animal that weighs, that is about this big or this big and weighs less than an ounce, sometimes a quarter of an ounce. They're very slow to reproduce. With a few exceptions, the Lazarines, um, most bat species have one young per year, some have two. So they're barely replacing themselves each year. They're very sight faithful, and that's a relative thing. That's a sliding scale. But I mentioned earlier about us considering bats to be roost limited, and that may be driving that, root, that sight faithfulness. They're faithful not only to where they forage, but they're faithful to those roost sites. And it's well understood that if nothing happens to a bat roost, the bats will use it ad infinitum. If something happens to the roost that interrupts that, but the roost is still available, bats will return to it. On the wall, for those of you that are here, you can see a poster that I put together about a project that talks a little bit about how that happened with a colony of Townsend's big-eared bats. Many of them, not all, have very large home ranges, um, and kind of in the traditional sense in that year-round, they may make large seasonal movements and they may have large foraging territories. Others make smaller seasonal movements and have smaller foraging uh, territories. But in general, as a volant animal, they do things that surprise us. Some of the wonderful radio telemetry studies that have gone on in the last 10 years have shown uh, some really large movement scales. One thing that's also very um, both um, interesting 
integral to bats is that in parts of their range where we see large seasonal swings, where it actually becomes winter, there are species or, and or populations of species that overwinter in torpor or will migrate to locations where they can truly hibernate. And I'm gonna talk a little, bit more, a little bit more about that. Why this has the red, why these two have the red asterisk is because many people consider or believe, misunderstand that uh, bats that are present in a summer roost vacate it for the winter. And that is extremely hazardous to their health for us to believe that. Many bat species overwinter in the same summer roost that they've been using. And I'll, I'll talk about that. All right, here's the big red ink. Now this is lifted from a paper that was uh, done many years ago about bioacoustic work and not comparing bioacoustics for, you know, bird song essentially to, to bioacoustics for bats. And unfortunately in the world of permitting and the regulatory world for bats, what we see too often is that measures that are perfectly appropriate and applied for birds are also used for bats. There are many reasons why that is not good for bats. First and foremost is the kind of bimodal seasonality of bats in many parts of their range in California. In Southern California, it is different and I will talk about that. But I will be referring mostly to areas where we have demonstrably different temperatures during winter, summer, spring, fall. So when it gets cold enough so that bats, though they are endothermic, they are very affected by external temperatures. When it gets cold enough so that they have difficulty maintaining their own metabolic activity, they will go into torpor. That happens on a daily basis, by the way. They will drop their body temperatures if possible. It depends on what kind of a roost we're talking about, maternity roost or not. They'll drop their body temperatures during the day when they're sleeping and they'll raise them up before flying and they'll be active during the night when they go and forage on insects. So, uh, I'd mentioned about um, the roost dependency. And so the maternity season is obviously going to be a time period when most bat species are highly dependent on roost sites. So we tend to think in the regulatory um, business, if you will, about those reproductive sites. Those have a pretty high hierarchy for us. Often, however, what we're not thinking about are those winter sites. The winter sites where bats may be inactive but we're making the incorrect assumption that they're not. During that time period, they may be so inactive that you don't even know they're there. And I, I in the course of doing thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of work with bats in structures, I've had many people tell me, we don't have bats in the winter, they all move out. And then we find, in fact, that they just overwintered in the structure. <clears throat> so that's why I keep harping on this. Some bats overwinter in the same roost, or locality or region in which they spend the summer months. Now, some species are cold tolerant. Aptescus fuscus comes to mind. It's, it's a pretty well-documented example. I've actually found them flying, I forget what the lower temperatures were, like 38 degrees in rain. Um, some are not uh, cold tolerant, and they really want to either fly long distances to where they can remain active through the winter, or they have adapted to using seasonal winter torpor for the time periods, maybe two weeks at a time or three weeks at a time where it's really cold or rainy. And then as soon as it warms up a little bit or dries up, they'll go and fly and catch insects if they're available or just drink water. Some species really do make that true migratory north-south movement. We have a lot of east-west, up and down around the area. A lot of the bats that are in you know, the Sacramento area, Sacramento area have been shown to move to where I live, Santa Rosa, not Santa Rosa per se, but to the coastal range there. Um, why? Because the, the temperatures, the temperature swings are not as extreme. The winter temperatures are not that extreme. I, I have a lot of Townsend's work that I've done. Uh, this is an example on the wall that's actually on the coast where, you know, it's constantly being hit by summertime wind driven fog and it's cool. Uh, and yet they're thriving in some of these locations. So, you know, we need to be cognizant that bats don't have just this clearly identifiable 
um, temperature requirements. It's got to be warm. It's got to be, you know, cold. Uh, they're doing a lot of different things at a lot of different times during the year. One great example our subspecies of Brazilian free tail bat is considered the migratory subspecies. And yet, in many parts of its range where it doesn't need to make those move movements into Central and South America, it simply doesn't do it. It will actually go into torpor. And I've had many, 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 many populations of Tederita Tader brasiliensis that overwinter in the Bay Area, in the greater Bay Area. So this can be really helpful for folks to understand that not all bats use the same types of roosts. Many people who think of bats think of caves. We have bats that really prefer to use crevices. So that could be, natural setting would be rock crevices. It could be the deep fissures in a tree. It could be the crevices under exfoliating bark. Analogs of that for anthropogenic roofs could include the gap between a, a roof gutter and the fascia behind it, or a fascia and the wall, or flashing and a roof. So there are species that really do like to use crevices. There are species, however, that really prefer cavities. Townsend's bigger bat is a really easy example of a bat that is really what we consider a caverniculous roosting species. It likes, for the most part, very large open spaces. It really doesn't prefer to use crevices. They will escape to them when they need to. But then there's also a flip-flop there. There are some species that would use cavities that are well adapted to using crevices and vice versa. And just as a side note, that works in our favor. It makes it a little more challenging if we're trying to just break everything down into where they roost because they're more adaptive than we often think they are, but it also gives us some opportunities that I'll be talking about later in the talk when I talk about mitigation roost habitat. So we've talked about kind of the spatial aspects of, of roost, crevice, cavity. Oh, I didn't talk about trees. I'm gonna back up a second because what we have are also obligate tree roosting bat species. We have, for example, western red bat, hoary bat, yellow bat, they tend to roost primarily in the foliage of trees. Oddly enough, red bats could be roosting in foliage on the ground, which is quite a management challenge. They could be roosting in wood piles, and they will. Um, but when we talk of lazurine bat species, we find that they typically are associated with trees. Silver-haired bat is an interesting one. It is actually a tree bat that forms colonies generally not very large colonies, but they also have been found utilizing other types of roosts, not strictly trees. But when we talk about bats, we don't want to make assumptions that they're not using trees. That, that has its own kind of set of challenges and solutions. Here's another area where oftentimes people get confused, and I see this a lot in environmental impact reports and bioassessment reports, and sometimes even in permits, where it is thought that a day roost is occupied during the day, and that is the kind of roost that we want to conserve because they're at their most, um, they're at most risk in the day roost of disturbance or destruction of the roost, and that they are all gone at night. But what we need to be thinking about is the fact that, A, a day roost is both a day roost and a night roost during maternity season. Those pups are non-volant and they are left in the roost while the mom, moms go out and feed on insects and then come back to lactate for those young. So a maternity roost is both a day roost and a night roost. Um, a, it could be the same for, not, um, say, non-reproductive males or non-reproductive females. A matern, a, excuse me, a bachelor colony of males. They could use the same roost during the day that they go forage and maybe they're not using a different night roost someplace, they're coming right back to that same roost. On the other hand, if you look at that image on the right, um, those are all bats. <laughs> they, they, that is during the day. That is what we would normally consider to be a night roost. It's a more open space that captures a lot of heat from the daytime heat rising up from the soil and the ground and then captured in the concrete. And then it's got heat from the concrete that 
that radiates down into that wonderful space, and that's what bats love at night. That's why bridges are so popular, one reason why bridges are so popular with bats. Night roosts are really, really important restore, roost resources for bats. Underrepresented, I think, in that case. Here, this happens to be in Arizona. This was during a bat research conference many, many years ago. And I took this photograph of these bats during the day. It was just so hot, they had to be outside during the day. So you can start to get the message that bats really, every, everything we say about bats is in our language. They just do what they're doing. We have to try and find ways of explaining what they're doing. Um, CEQA, LSA, every, every law and regulation we have, that's a human construct to try to manage a wildlife taxa. So we have to always keep in mind that they can't fit our model. We have to keep expanding our model to fit what they're doing. That means we have to learn a lot. So let's talk a little bit more about how day roosts are used. What is their importance? Well, I think it's kind of obvious that bats are active at night and largely inactive during the day. They will be active to some extent in roosts during the day, but for the most part, that's where they rest. Call it sleep. Most people who have bats living in their house would say that the bats never sleep because they're always making noise and moving around, driving them nuts. Day roosts are used for protection from light, from airflow, from predators, from you know whatever they would be exposed to, predation. Also in maternity season, they're used for raising pups. It's an incredibly important portion of their life history. Excuse me. So I have in red ink there something that I try to tell all of my clients and all the people that I come in contact with that are working on project sites to try to get them invested in this roost that they wish really wasn't causing them problems. And remember when I told you about bats being the longest living mammal for their size and uh, that they're slow to reproduce? One of the other elements about bats is that largely, particularly with colonial species, they are matriarchal. These are matriarchal societies, if you will. So the, bat, the males, once they've bred with the females, they generally, with most of our species, have what we call bachelor sites or bachelor colonies in some cases. And the females have their maternity sites where they're raising their young. Uh, they're generally not reproductive age males or reproductive males with in maternity roosts. So what you have, is you have the pups, male or female. Then you have mama, grandma, great-grandma, great-great-grandma, and just keep going up 20 years, 25, 30, 40 years. You could have 30 generations of a species of wildlife living in a roost. That to me is staggering. It just gives me the chills every time I think about it or voice it to somebody. It's incredibly meaningful. This helps us understand just how important roost sites are. This isn't just for that cohort that's there this year. This is everyone that ever came before them in this lifespan of this creature. And then obviously day roosts are used during hibernation. When is a day roost also a night roost? Also during hibernation. In hibernation or even in seasonal torpor where they're, um, they're not Maybe they're, they're exiting the roost once every couple of weeks if it's opportunistically possible for them to do so. During hibernation, they sure aren't. They're there. Now, night roosts, when we kind of separate those out from day roosts, and we say, okay, these are specifically night roosts, here's what those are used for. Prey processing. What we mean by that is when they go off to forage, some of these species of bats are catching large insects, and some of them can't just process them on the fly. They can't just go scoop into the mouth and keep flying like many of the myota species and some of the smaller species that are taking smaller insect prey will do. So they're taking larger insect prey. Pallid bats, great example because here's a pallid bat night roost. And they're taking Jerusalem crickets or scorpions or beetles or large moths and it takes them time to pick those things apart and eat them and digest them and they may get, you know, two Jerusalem crickets could last a bat each night. So they're spending some downtime. So what are they doing there? They're resting, and we think that there is intraspecific communication going on there. They, they have a lot of social conversation, a lot of social calls. So we suspect that 
that that's a high likelihood, that they're talking amongst themselves. And I've always speculated there may be interspecific uh, communication going on there. We don't know. I haven't learned how to speak that. So I have said this a number of times because I, I've, I think that it, it bears remembering that this is true for many, many types of roosts. And it's particularly true for colonial bat species that form these large aggregates in things like uh, human-made structures. Oh, by the way, I'm going to back up a bit because I wanted to show you where the night roost is. And this is a very typical thing to see. So I'll try and stay in front of the camera for those of you online, but I'm going to use the laser pointer. One of, one of my long-term pallet bat research sites where I did my banding and radio telemetry study in the Carneros region of Napa um, has an, a winery office building where pallet bats have been roosting under there during day and night for 15, 20 years now. So they, they really can become adaptive to what is available to them and what is below their threshold of disturbance. All right, so I've harped on that a lot, but um, it is important to recognize that some of these movements may only be down the block. Um, so if we think of bats that have moved out of a summer roost, oftentimes they've actually just moved to another nearby roost location. And I and others have found this a lot with some large colony bats, like Brazilian free-tail bats, that after young are self-sufficiently volant and they, they just leave in mass, and all of a sudden the summer roost is empty. So people think, oh, wait, there's no bats. Two weeks later, they're back. Now, it could be some of the same individuals or all of the same individuals, or it could be immigrants from other populations. But there is a, a dynamicism to bat roosts. Bats are constantly moving in and out. There's some speculation of why bats may leave a roost like that, they, there has been, I think, great speculation that ectoparasite load gets to be too much, so they leave, and then the ectoparasites leave or drop dead, and then the bats return. That's an interesting possibility. Bats really love bridges, and there are a number of reasons for that. I kind of hinted at a couple of them, but bats really select things that are visible in the landscape. By the way, everybody knows that bats aren't blind, right? They don't just rely on uh, echolocation. They, they um, utilize their eyesight, and some have quite handy eyesight, thank you very much. And so they're looking for these very large features in the landscape, which is why you find bridges or very large or tall old Victorian homes, big buildings, commercial buildings, things that are noticeable in the landscape. And think about yourselves as a bat, not five feet off of the ground or six feet off of the ground. Think of yourself up in the air. 100, 200, 300 feet, 500 feet or more. What do you see? Look at a Google image and you'll see what they see. Now that you start thinking about how the bat thinks, what they're looking for in the landscape, what their search image is. And bridges are perfect for that. They're, they're these generally, not always, concrete structures. They don't need to be, by the way. Bats will occupy wood structures, wood bridges, that absorb a lot of daytime heat and retain it at night. So it really helps during maternity season, which is typically when females are choosing really, really warm sites, so that they can reduce the maternal input into those young. In other words, if those young are at the high, you know, point, uh, high curve of the thermal neutral zone, they're not burning off a lot of energy trying to stay warm. So the females have to lactate less for those young. So it's a very important and a critical selection for them to choose roosts that are very, very warm. I've been in maternity roost sites that are 120 degrees. They're picking really hot sites. I've seen Tadarida with melted ears. They are scarred ears from, oops, from roosting beneath the corrugated metal roofs between those and the underlayment. So they're picking really, really hot sites. They can sub sustain those temperatures. Um, so bridges are really great because of that thermal stability. 
but they also occur where? Over really fantastic foraging habitat. And so you see the red ink there. This, this is, this is, these are kind of two areas that have almost always have regulatory involvement when you're talking about a bridge seismic upgrade, a bridge replacement, a new bridge, whether it's small or large. You've got CEQA that's going to come into effect for all of the other aspects, let alone the biology. And in almost all cases, you'll have a lake and stream good alteration permit. So bridges are probably one of the real top trigger points in, in my mind for regulatory involvement. And I'm sure in yours as well. Oh, there's the same photo, uh, no, that, that same project over there. Um, bats love buildings. Not all bat species will use buildings and not all of them will use them frequently. Um, and not all buildings are universally loved by bats. But it, it, it bears understanding that a building does not have to look like this rundown old historic structure for bats to find it occupiable. For the first 13 years of my work, I specialized in doing humane wildlife damage control, specializing in bats. And that's where I really learned how bats are using struck man-made, human-made structures. And all, really 99% of those calls in those 13 years were not buildings like this. They were occupied structures. They were your house, my house, my office building, your office building. So bats adapt, particularly are more ubiquitous and adaptive species, which are, in our area, Brazilian free-tailed bats and Yuma myotas. All right, so now we're gonna kind of shift gears. I've given you some of the biology, some of the roosting ecology. Now what we're gonna do is start moving into the regulatory arena. Now I want everybody to memorize this. Okay, now, no. No, no, honestly, I did this on purpose because, you know, laws and regs change, uh, they evolve, the numbers change. This is really to show you that there are a lot of laws and regulations that either directly or indirectly provide protections for bats. So it's important for us to recognize that we're not just talking about CESA, California Endangered Species Acts. We're not just talking about threatened, endangered, or rare. We have what I think it's 11 or 12 California species of special concern bats out of 25, that's not good. Uh, Townsend's big-eared bat was a candidate species. It was treated as if it was listed while it was in its candidacy. But all of them are non-game mammals. And I'm going to be talking about my paradigm for how we address bats when we conduct habitat assessments, when we write mitigation measures, when we write avoidance measures, um, permits, etc. So that's uh, section 4150. Um, also, Caltrans has their own environmental policies and procedures, as does the Federal Highway Administration. And those come into play with transportation projects. So again, this is just to show you that we're not, this is why we wanted to kind of expand the focus of this from just um, CEQA and LSA. Having said that, now let's bore a little deeper into the LSA program. All of the agency people understand this, you're all pros at this, but the LSA program reviews projects that would have a substantial impact on the bed, channel, or bank of any river, stream, or lake, and it also places conditions on projects to conserve existing fish and wildlife resources. All right, so let's get some examples of that. I already gave you one, bridges, culverts. Culverts are also in generally in similar types of settings as our bridges. And culverts can sometimes be disassociated from, from water. They can be under um, vehicular bridges. In Southern California, I worked on a project with a colleague of mine on the SR-91 where there's a whole bunch of culverts and the expansion joints and the culverts are very popular with the bats there. And those form incredibly important roost sites because it's so hot out there. And those are stable temperature locations for many bat species. What else occurs in um, areas that could be uh, under the purview of an LSA? Well, um, associated structures. There could be a pump station, pump building. There could be other old buildings that are adjacent to that. 
Trees, of course. And we've talked about obligate tree roosting species, but I only touched on the fact that we have colonial bat species that will also use trees. So the same species you will find in buildings, in some cases, could use trees. Cavities, crevices, exfoliating bark. It's like my mantra that I tell all of my clients. That's what I tell all the tree cutters when I'm working with tree cutters, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by that. And that's something that we, we need to be constantly thinking about as well. CEQA, I think we all know, is intended to identify significant impacts and to notify the public and to uh, provide the opportunity for the public to comment on those, th on those things. Also, in the course of that, to establish appropriate measures for avoidance of take of special status species, direct mortality, if you want to say, of non-special status species. I'm getting close to where I tell you why I don't use common species. And um, to avoid and minimize potentially significant impacts. In fact, let me, let me jump ahead with that. I don't like using the word common species. What do we think of, for example, skunks? We, skunks are a common species. We don't have a listed skunk. But what about spotted skunk? Anybody seen a spotted skunk lately? Co common species? I used to see them. I, I mean, I haven't seen one in about five years, and I was looking for them. Um, so what happens with common species is they drop off our radar. We don't pay attention to them. You know, you can kind of get away with that with something that forms small family groups. You can't get away with that, that with something that forms colonies of 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 individuals, which you will get with these common species. I call them non-species of special concern species. So uh, those two ubiquitous species I mentioned earlier, Yuma myotis, Brazilian free tail. These are, we call them common species. However, and this is kind of the sub part, I did a lot of analysis of this for my chapter in the California Bat Conservation Plan. These are species that when they form these huge populations, if something happens to that roost, you've taken out a huge population. They're not spread out around the landscape. This is a concentrated population. So now what you have is what we would consider to be a common species that now has had a tremendous impact to a local breeding population. So in the in con course of conducting uh, CEQA analysis and preparation of CEQA documents is, of course, Appendix G, where you need to be looking at analyzing any uh, adverse effects, significant adverse effects on a whole range of things, including special status species, uh, through, you know, either direct impacts to the bats or whatever it is, but I'll, we're talking about bats, or through habitat modification. So this is where I'm urging you to think about the fact that we can't be just thinking of TE in our species, threatened and endangered rare species. We could be talking about a colony I ha routinely have bridges that have six, 10,000 Tadarida or humanensis. That is a very significant local population. So <clears throat> we need to be thinking about what are the impacts of removal of that roost? What are the impacts of removal when bats are occupying it? That's simply not tenable. And there, go back to our other laws and regulations protecting bats. Well, they're a non gay mammal. My position with my clients is you don't have the right to take them, even if they're not a CSC. My position with consultants whose reports I'm asked to sometimes review is, yeah, I'll get it, I get it. Your, your table of special status species needs to stay pure just for special status species. But your text, your text should have a discussion about non-CSC species. So, you know, that is um, sometimes not comfortable for CEQA specialists or for planners, CEQA planners because they live in the realm of the regulatory construct. Well, I don't. So I will impose that on my projects and help people understand why it's really in their interests. You know, we've had projects, we've seen projects where the non-CSC bat species were not addressed and there were huge mortalities and it causes a project to shut down. We've had projects where they didn't pay attention to it on bridges and it causes project delays. And we, as consultants, always need to be thinking about preventing 
project delays because we know that projects are going to go forward. What we want is for nothing to fall through the cracks because when things fall through the cracks, people often just go ahead and do it and ask for permission later. They ask forgiveness rather than permission. So when we go back to Appendix G, uh, we look at substantial adverse effect on any riparian habitat. Again, we've got uh, the potential for wonderful tree roost habitat in those riparian areas. And impede use of a native wildlife nursery site. And just change that to maternity site and there we go. Now, <clears throat> Melanie um, and I had a discussion about this mandatory finding of significance and unfortunately I think that she's going to be much more eloquent than I am in, in really the exploration of how effective a tool this is uh, for those of you in permitting and planning. But if you read the text, the potential to degrade the quality of environments, substantially reduce habitat of a fish or wildlife species, cause a population to drop below sustaining levels, threaten to eliminate a community, reduce number or range of a TENR species, or substantially reduce their habitat. If we go up to the middle of that, uh, substantially reduce habitat of a fish or wildlife species. That gets back to my argument of if we have a non-CSC species that's forming a locally significant population, that to me is a threshold. So I'm going to move on from there. I think I've preached to the choir. So now what we're going to talk about is how do we put these things into practice? We've got some of the building blocks. We've got some better understanding of bat biology. We have a better understanding of roosting ecology, which is kind of even closer to the bone there. It's where bats are roosting and when and how. So now what do we do? What do we do with this knowledge? We have the regulatory arena and we have this, the way these bats live. How do we make that happen? Um, in the, oh, I don't need to use a laser. You can see these three photographs just as examples of some solutions to these problems. The upper left is a photograph of a uh, concrete bat habitat panel that I designed for a bridge in San Joaquin County. That's being installed um, by these workers on bent caps. This was one of these projects, by the way, where even after years and years of review, and by the way, if you don't know, bridge projects typically have a 10 or 15 or longer year process from conception to completion. The month they went to construction in June, they discovered bats there. There's no reason for that. There are definitely pitfalls in the regulatory process in CEQA. One of the pitfalls is not having attentive or qualified people doing your bioassessments early on in the project. I'm going to talk a lot about that. So this was a project where uh, Caltrans basically said, you must hire this person because we know that that person can come up with solutions or we're going to make you wait until next year. And they had all the materials and all the equipment there. You, you just know how expensive that would be. So we were able to complete this project with one mortality of one Myotis shimonensis. But what we did uh, to offset the potential for greater mortality was say, okay, we're going to put up a lot of habitat that wasn't originally designed to go on or in this bridge. So that, yes, we may lose some bats from this year, but we want to improve the habitat so there's more habitat than there was before for the seismic up upgrade. So that's what they're installing. In the upper right is a photograph of a, an historic building, California State Park historic building. Those little squares, if you will, that you see are one-way exits that are adaptations, one of my adaptations of my design for one-way exits for bats. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. To get bats out of a roost and prevent them from re-entering the roost before it's sealed up or the building is taken down or whatever, it's going to, whatever is going to occur. In the lower right is a photograph of an array of one of my bat roost designs that was used as temporary roost habitat. And I'm going to talk a little bit about pros and cons of temporary bat roost habitat. It's not super straightforward all the time. 
So being successful really requires that we synthesize all of the things that we've been talking about, but actually you should know a lot more than what we've talked about. <laughs> you know, the science and the biology of bats, along with the regulations. So you need to have an understanding or work with somebody who has an understanding of the laws and regs, the regulatory process. You need to understand the site conditions and the practical application of avoidance measures. I often see in reports recommended avoidance measures that simply don't work. One example is put one-way exits on trees. There are many, many times where you will have 20, 30, 50 bat habitat trees. Nobody's climbing those trees and putting up one-way exits. Sometimes you couldn't even find somebody skilled enough to make those one-way exits that would be effective. There are many cases where the trees are only, only accessible by climbing, not accessible by equipment. It is simply infeasible. It cannot be done in any real world situation. There are many instances like that, not, not just with trees, where things are thought of with the right intention, but from a practical perspective, speaking of somebody who has done all that, they won't work. So we need to avoid things that won't work. We need to do things that do work because we don't want take. We don't want direct mortality. So we need to understand all the roosting ecology and this next phrase that I'm going to be repeating now until you get sick of it, seasonal periods of bad activity. If we can start to think about this bimodality, if you will, of bats in most of their parts of California, not all, Southern California, they could be active all the time, but this seasonal bimodality where you have in the summer non-volant young in the maternity roost. They become self-sufficiently volant. They start flying. They may disperse from that roost or not. And then we get into the winter, and now what you have is winter torpor or hibernation. So there we have everybody who's not flying, pretty much. So what does that leave us with? Two fairly small windows of opportunity for doing things like humane bat eviction partial dismantling of a structure, which I'll talk about, two-step tree removal, which I'll talk about. You can do surveys at other times of the year, but actually removing habitat and all the preventative measures of keeping bats from being killed before you remove that habitat, unless you can show absence of bats in that habitat, you need, you're constrained by this bimodality, by these seasonal windows of opportunity to this work. So you need to understand that. And if you're making a recommendation or if you're reading a report that has recommendations for how to get bats off of a bridge, it really should be written by somebody who knows how bridges are constructed or the materials or the designs or particularly buildings. If I tried to break down, I was talking about it on the drive over here with folks today, I tried to break down how many hours I've spent crawling on, in, and around buildings. I think it's over 11,000 hours when I count in everything. So you know you've got to have an understanding of construction materials, construction methods, the tools, the uh, terminology. That's incredibly important. When I write a report, every time I go to a project site, I will ask the contractors or the engineers, what do I call this if I'm not already familiar with it? Or if it's called different things, I'll, I'll want to know what they call it. If they don't call it a pilaster, I want to call it what they call it because I want to use their words. But, you know, we want to make sure that we know what we're talking about. <clears throat> Also, we've got to navigate the seasonal constraints of other taxa, and so when we're talking about an LSA, or we're talking about riparian habitat, for example, we're dealing with an adramus fish oftentimes. When we're talking about trees or even buildings, we're talking about nesting birds. So those pose challenges when it comes to, say, the nesting bird season, because it occurs or begins prior to when bats become active enough to do humane eviction or two-step removal or whatever it is to get them out of a structure. Because that doesn't start until about March 1. So we have to be thinking of how do we address that. Oftentimes the way to address that is if you can determine that bats are absent in the winter, if that's possible, remove the habitat in the winter. So there's no habitat for birds or bats because it's going to go. Or during the period of dispersal when all young are self-sufficiently volant, after the maternity season, but before overwintering, 
evict them from the structure then. And I've done many, many projects where we've evicted them in that fall window when they would normally be dispersing to wherever they're going to go. And all the young are self-sufficiently volant. They're not just flying. They're actually done lack, you know, drinking milk from the moms. And they're capable of capturing their own insects. And they're not dependent on that particular roost site anymore. So that's when we do that work. Then the project isn't delayed. Then they can, before February 1, um, I, some permits I see February 15 for birds, um, then they're not constrained or birds don't become an interference with, with bats. So we, we must be thinking about those issues as well. With anadromous fish, often you've got to get out by October 15th. That happens to coincide really well with typical weather patterns where we start to get a drop in evening temperatures to the point where bats, many bat species can become largely inactive. So sometimes we'll have, you know, really warm spells in October or November, but, you know, I don't like pushing bats out past the third week of October because they're simply tied to that area now. They really don't have many opportunities to find other roost sites, even if they know where they are, to go to those other roost sites if you're evicting them too close to the winter just because you want to take advantage of a warm spell. So <clears throat> let's kind of move into, for those agency folks who are here and for those who are on the webcast who are consultants or interested in getting into um, conducting habitat assessments, I'm not going to be talking about how to do bat survey work. We're not talking about mist netting and harp trapping and all that kind of fun stuff that we do for research. What we're talking about here are, are practical measures, approaches, techniques, and tools for doing work in the regulatory environment. So when you need to, as an agency staff person, biologist, planner, permitter, look at what you're seeing come across your desk uh, in terms of recommended actions, you may have a difficult time with really understanding whether or not that's appropriate or the best method or whatever. So it helps to start with the person proposing it. Are they, is there any evidence that they're, they're trained with work for bats? Now, you know, and, and depending on, excuse me, the sensitivity of the bat species and what's being recommended. I mean, if somebody's recommending something, you know, really kind of complex for pallet bats or Townsend's for, goodness sakes, or, you know, some other, you know, rare bat, special status bat that has a kind of a more sensitive life history or, or roosting ecology, this becomes even more of an issue. But in general, and that's, and by the way, that's where I would suggest you want to start looking to see if they have an actual scientific collection permit and permissions for bats. Because that would suggest or indicate that they've, they've actually spent the time to focus on bats to actually spend field time with bats. And they're not just um, writing reports based on cribbing stuff from other reports. And sorry about an offending people, but I often see reports where clearly language has been taken from a section of one of my reports and a section from somebody else's report, and then from, you know, kind of the best intentions and all mashed together. And unfortunately, many times they conflict. And that's not really the way to do it. The way to do it is to know what you are actually talking about. I would never tell a bridge engineer how to engineer the bat replacement bat habitat that I'm creating for his bridge or her bridge. I give them all the biological requirements and my sketches, and then we work back and forth with many iterations until they engineer it the way it needs to be engineered for that bridge. And that's kind of the same way with bats. Why should bats be easy? Why should bats just be simple? They're not. They're very complex. So why do we expect it to all be just simple? It's not. We need to step up as practitioners and understand that we don't know what we don't know. And it's a bit of a challenge to those that are getting into it because it can be difficult to get the experience that you need. And I understand that. I, it took me five years to get my MOU. We used to call them MOUs uh, for bats. So I, I know how hard it is. But at the same time, our goal is don't kill bats. And let's make measures that can serve the populations in the habitat as much as possible. So we need to step up our knowledge, our expertise, our time in the field with people who know what they're doing uh, in order to get that, that experience. 
So that's what you would want to be evaluating in a report that you're reviewing as an agency um, staff person. So then if they're, say, proposing going into a roost, well, is it safe or appropriate for them to be doing so? Is it necessary? Could they be doing an exter external survey? Could, be they, could they be doing an external survey during seasonal periods of activity, you know, maternity season, when females are flying out, when those young are starting to fly out and they get the whole population? Uh, not going into a roost in the winter or in the maternity season when they could be disturbing young or disturbing adults and causing mortality. Are they using the right equipment? And for those of you here today, I've brought just a very, very tiny subset. And when I say tiny, we fill up a whole pickup truck and more of gear when we're doing a more intensive bat survey. Um, you, you know, need to have the best equipment that you can get and afford to do the best bat surveys you can do. You can do certain types of assessments and surveys with more minimal equipment, with less extravagant equipment. You can do that. Um, that set of night vision goggles on the screen, that cost me $10,000. I have three sets of night vision goggles, and I have seven infrared sensitive camcorders, and I have six, five or six infrared sensitive CCD cameras that I make camera systems with. I mean, spend the, the money on the proper equipment because poor quality equipment will give you poor quality results. You won't get the resolution that you require to see features. You won't get detection that you require. And I'm going to um, talk a little bit about that here. So night vision equipment is really good at, at both detection and if you're close enough, identification. One of the sets of, excuse me while I walk off camera. This is my cheapest set at 5,000. This uh, is similar to another set that I have that has a um, remo removable lens assembly so that I can put telephoto lenses on it. And we've actually used this to watch Peristrellus. I was going to call it Pipistrellus, still old. Um, <laughs> Peristrellus hesperus um, emerging from a rock face and then foraging on the moths that were also emerging from the rock face. They never left the rock face. So when you have good equipment, you see behavioral activity. You can start to identify behavioral things that you wouldn't have no noticed and draw a lot of information, a lot of data from that. So you need to be thinking about the type of equipment you're using, if you're a practitioner in the field, or the type of equipment that people were using when you're reviewing their report. Was it sufficient? Was it even possible to use? Um, Bioacoustic detectors are great, as we have learned so much. Um, they're wonderful for detection. By the way, does everybody know the difference between a detection and identification? So detection is just seeing if it's there. Identification is, oh, Hi, I know who you are. Oh, um, that's what we mean by the difference between those two. And so acoustic detectors can hear calls of bats that we can't see. And to a great extent, but it's not a perfect science, it can identify many bat species. It cannot identify all bat species in all settings. That's another caveat. It's very, you need to be very cautious about acoustic surveys that are done in a forest, for example. How are you going to know what tree those bats came out of if you're just using a detector that has a cone of reception? You'll never know what tree those bats came out of. You need to be looking at those trees. Um, thermal imaging is, is a tool that has been used um, in the last 15 years or so as the prices have come down on smaller units. But it is much better for detection, sometimes better than night vision equipment, than uh, it is for identification. And, Anybody who's seen a thermal image will understand why. You basically have a blob. I sent an email to Scott Osborne uh, a couple years ago who said he was asked by somebody about using, doing a project that using thermal imaging to look for Townsend's bigger bat. So I sent him a picture of a bat house that I had taken a, a thermal image photograph of underneath. And it's just blobs, you know. It's really colorful and entertaining. And you know there's bats there because they're blobs. but. You would not know the species unless you heard them acoustically or saw them 
emerging. All right. Trying to avoid the egotism of this, but this is really how I present my work to my clientele. So I have a rule. Now, my clientele isn't just the end user, the, the project proponent. I actually subcontract to a lot of larger consulting firms that don't have their own expertise, in-house expertise. And unfortunately, one, what happens with some of the larger firms that, that don't have a lot of really focused um, biology staff is they work much more in the regulatory and planning environment than they do in the biological environment. So it can, there can be blind spots there. And so they'll, they'll fall back on writing measures that say do a pre-construction survey, 30 days before construction, 15 days before construction. And I'm going to talk about why that's a problem as soon as I take a drink of water here. <clears throat> 15 more minutes. I'm going to boogie. Okay, so do instead an early habitat assessment, qualified bat biologist. Pre-construction surveys are usually getting to be too late. In other words, a project could be going to construction. If it's in construction in 30 days, and that happens to be in June, that's maternity season. So what happens when you find bats? You've got yourself a delayed project, or you've, you're scrambling to try to prevent take of, of bats. Um, pre-construction surveys are sometimes not even possible. I talked about trees. How would you do a pre-construction survey of 15 or 20 or 30 trees? You're not going to climb up in those trees and look. You're going to have to do night emergence surveys. So that's one observer per tree, per night, and then you've got to mobilize the tree cutters the next day or maybe two days later because bats that use trees tend to switch roosts more frequently than they do more stable roosts. So we want to make sure we don't have bats moving in before the tree gets removed. Um, so we need to be cognizant of that time period between surveys and the actual habitat removal. So what I recommend to consultants is that they provide CDFW with early consultation. Give them a detailed habitat assessment. And by detailed habitat assessment, when I go out and do a detailed habitat assessment, it is almost a focus survey because I'm able to tell so much from you know, a daytime habitat assessment of that structure, generally for me it's structures, or those habitat features on trees when I do those, that I, I can tell to, in many cases, what species, or at least some of the species that are using that structure, how they're using the structure, where they're using the structure. And I can often come up with avoidance measures and sometimes even mitigation habitat measures without doing additional surveys. It allows you time, if you do a habitat assessment early in the months, months in advance, to develop and implement avoidance measures. Critical. All right. Greg's rule number two, and I really wish I had a picture of a bat on my head so I could be controlled by the bat, but. Uh, so what I mean by that is they should be controlling us. Their biology should be controlling us. Their seasonal periods of bat activity should dictate appropriate surveys that we do, avoidance measures, mitigation uh, measures that are appropriate for each region locality, um, roost type, it's not going to apply to every single roost, and the species involved. Now, we don't need to be parsing everything out by species. We need to be thinking about the seasonal periods of activity, and that will encompass all the species that we have here in California. So it can be very useful to do additional surveys, and sometimes it's really required because for example, if you find that during the daytime assessment you have a bridge that has a lot, of activity, a lot of evidence of bat activity, you're going to want to have a better understanding of the population and um, the species assemblage. But keep in mind, a survey is a point in time. It is one data point. And I said earlier, roosts are dynamic, and they are. You've got bats moving in, moving out, and all throughout the year, that mix of species and the numbers change. It's remarkable. So what I recommend in most cases is uh, conduct an early habitat assessment first, write your avoidance measures, your mitigation measures, 
you'll have plenty of time to put them into practice during those seasonal periods of bad activity when it's appropriate to do that work. For example, humane eviction. That is, by the way, the installation of blockage. If you're talking about a structure that can have this done to it, say it's your house, and you would block all the potential openings that bats could use but are not currently using, and then you would put one-way exits on the active openings. You would allow enough time, usually four to seven nights, for the bats to leave those one-way exits. They're no longer able to return because you've blocked all the potential openings. Then you seal up those remaining openings. Uh, there are some times where projects, particu particularly bridge projects, will extend over multiple years. Um, and I mentioned very early on that I'm, I'm ambivalent sometimes about the use of temporary roost habitat, and here's why. When you install bat houses as temporary roost habitat, you first have to exclude the bats from the bridge, as our example. So that's fairly traumatic for the bats. And if you're talking about six, 10,000 bats, that's a, a lot of bats that are displaced. You put up bat roost habitat. If you're fortunate, a small subset will use those. It's not a great, it's not 100%. Well, then what are you doing when it's time to take those down? Now you're doing humane eviction from this set of bat houses again. Because generally speaking, temporary bat houses mean they're going to go away. They're not going to let them fall down. They want to remove them. Well, the problem with that is bat houses are small structures, and the bats are a quarter of an inch or a half an inch on the other side of that piece of wood. And when you start stapling in exclusion materials, those bats will fly out during the day. Now they are prey, and I didn't put in photographs of that. They are prey for raptors, ravens, crows, jays, insects. You know. So we want to avoid direct mortality. So if a project is going to interfere or, or if the habitat will be gone for one maternity season, I may be less willing to recommend temporary roost habitat. I typically am going to want to see that there's maybe a couple of seasons that are lost and then really try to formulate a way for minimizing the disturbance from removal from that temporary roost habitat. So there may be other measures. I talked a little bit about partial dismantling. There are some buildings that are in such poor condition you can't do humane eviction. So what you have to do is under direct supervision of a qualified bat biologist who knows how to do this work, remove portions of the structure that increase the light and airflow into the structure that cause the bats to abandon the roost on their own. Um, by the way, I have never had bats emerge from a roost while I've been doing humane bat eviction work or when I've done partial dismantling during the day. Never had it happen. If you do it properly, if you're careful about planning where you remove portions of a roost, how you do it, and the people you have working uh, with you or for you, you can do it without ever causing those bats to abandon during the day. Only time it's ever happened is when I was doing an exclusion on a bridge and the young uh, laborer that was working with me just could not keep his trap shut. And he was yelling down at the guy at the, operating the lift and bats started flowing out. And I said, I told you. So um, I've talked about the first two things. We're running out of time, so it's going to move quickly. Sometimes uh, we will have to augment partial dismantling with things like adding bright lights, added airflow. We'll put up big fans. Um, it sounds crazy, but those are kind of the elements that bats don't want in their roost, protection from light and excessive airflow in day roost. So sometimes those things can be supplemental but are rarely effective in and of themselves. Um, I've, asked, I've been asked many times, why don't we just wait until dark and then seal up the openings? If you had one opening and one building and you could do it with one person, that's fine. But if you're doing you know, 500 openings or 100 openings, it's not safe to work at night, um, just physically for the workers. Also, bats are active at night and they're flying in and out of the roost at night. Now you're putting people and bats in close proximity at night to each other. It's really, really a bad idea. If you do the work properly, you do it during the daytime. All right, so I mentioned a little bit about the feasibility of trees. And you look at that photograph on the left and, and imagine to yourself, how will I do a pre-construction survey? How will I do just a baseline presence absence survey? And why, why would I? What, what bats will be in exactly those trees in two weeks or two months or next year? Trees are changing all the time and bats are moving all the time. Um, it's not feasible. 
uh, if you look at the picture on the right, how would you climb that tree? You can't get a piece of equipment there. You're not climbing that tree because it's not safe. So what I did about 15 years ago was started to think about what could I do as a practical measure. And I started doing this on some um, projects that did not have permits, didn't have an LSA. And um, I started talking about this with our local CDFW biologist and explaining, taking them out in the field and showing them, doing a habitat assessment with them in the field. Took them to our local Oak Woodland and said, here's how I survey for habitat features. Here's how we would do a two-step removal. Here's the reasoning. So what I do, what I, a two-step removal in the way I, I, I do it, is first a habitat assessment to identify those trees with suitable potential roost habitat for bats. The trees that have suitable habitat are trimmed in a two-step process, well, they're removed in a two-step process. Day one, say Tuesday, we, um, not me, the tree cutter, often a climber, sometimes in a piece of equipment, under my supervision and instruction with my green laser, pointing exactly where I want them to cut, makes a cut outside of where the habitat feature is, the cavity, crevice, exfoliating bark. They basically alter this tree, they physically alter this tree by removing a lot of the canopy. And then the following day, they cut the tree down. So many people have expressed concern, well, what happens if there's bats still in the tree? So what I did the first five years that I was doing this is I monitored a, a large subset of the trees that we were removing in this way. And I looked, I examined every tree that fell on certain project sites and then some trees in other project sites. Looked in there with lights and with long um, flexible scope cameras to see if we had any live or dead bats in these trees that we had fallen. Never. I've had roof, um, wood rats in one tree. Never had bats. Now that could mean, well maybe bats were never there. And I started counting last night, the night before, how many trees do I think I've done this with? maybe 400, 500 trees. So what is the likelihood that 500 perfect bat habitat trees never had a single bat in them? So it's not, it is not a scientific approach in that we know 100% of, of our N. We have sampled it, but the rate has been so supportive of this that my feeling is very strong that we can remove trees done, if it's done under direct supervision by a qualified bat biologist who knows how to do this, without any mortality of bats. And in reality, there may be mortality of one or two individuals. But that's much better than coming up with a measure that really simply will never work. To do a, an acoustic survey through a forest like that and then say, I haven't heard very many bats, so we're good, would not be the way to minimize the potential for take. So there's a picture of a tree cutter up in the tree. Um, so I'm going to skip to the second item. I, so therefore, I feel that it's generally better to presume presence. You look at a tree that has habitat, presume presence, and then do the work during seasonal periods of bad activity. If you can survey the tree, and it is feasible, feasible and economically important to do so, I will oftentimes be up in a bucket truck, a man lift, scoping those trees to see if, if any bats are present because they've got to get that tree down it if it's at all possible. So we need to also remember to be flexible. We want to have as many tools in our quiver as we can. We don't want to just get fixated on, on one thing. I would say beware proposals that you see for simply acoustic surveys. I've talked about that. I recently saw one where it said to shake the tree. Also, I will tell you that in all of the trees that we've done this with, it's been thousands of trees. Well, like I said, about because we remove all the other trees too, right? I've never had a bat fly out during the day. We've never had a bat fly out during two-step tree removal, trimming of the tree. Never. So the response that bats have, when you watch bats, and, and this goes back to my evicting bats from bridges and buildings, they can be right behind a half inch of wood, and you're attaching uh, exclusion materials. They, their impulse is to move deeper into hiding, into the safety of their roost. Their safety is not outside flying around during the day. The roost is home and safety. So that's what they're more likely to do. And I actually have a video 
of me scoping a bat in a cavity where the bat was closer to the opening and pulled itself back higher up into the cavity because that's its natural response. So we want to be using their kind of natural behaviors and responses to work for us. Shaking a tree, I think, from my experience, is highly unlikely to work. And if it was to work, how hard would you have to shake it and what would be the impact of that bat? For the same reason, I don't think that we can say that striking a tree has enough potential for avoiding enough bats for it to be a feasible approach. So I prefer the kind of reaching for the 100%. So I'm going to have to move quickly through some of this. Um, OK, OK, thank you. Um, so when we're talking about mitigating loss of habitat, I've switched gears here now. When we talk about kind of coming up with new habitat, we already said we're not coming up with more land, right? Third item there. You know, we do have a problem. All these projects, they go forward. We lose trees. We lose old buildings. We, we lose whatever roost habitat is available to them. That land is forever changed, basically, unless we do something to replace some of the habitat that was there. Fortunately, some of the bat species that we have here in California can utilize artificial roosts, but not all of them can and not all of them will. You will not build a bat house for Townsend's Big Eared Bat. You build it for them, and they'll scoff at it. Um, so that last item, one thing I get a lot of is calls about, a, say, a bridge project where the engineer will say, well, I found these plans online, and here's what we want to use. And I say, well, you, you won't find my plans online. Um, and for my projects, I design the habitat for every bridge ind individually. And then the engineers work with me. Because in Northern California and Central California, the bridges are not as hom homogenous in design as they are in Southern California, where simple panels can be applied to most of those because most of those bridges are box girder, enclosed box girder bridges. Northern and Central California have a wider variety of bridge designs, and so I need to be thinking of a lot of different approaches. I happen to be kind of good at it, which I really enjoy, um, because now you're actually replacing something and oftentimes augmenting what was there. But what we don't want is for somebody that has not got thousands of hours of experience to be just designing something based on what they saw online or what they envisioned that they would use or with materials that they would just think would be better than what the bat biologist tells them to use. Um, because that's experimentation. I talked about um, bat houses and that only a, f uh, a few species will use them. Oftentimes also there's public opposition. If you put up bat houses in a public park, there are some people who will love it and some people who will hate it. There are still a lot of fears and misunderstanding about, misunderstandings about bats. There are also reasonable health concerns about bats. I, I would never recommend you put up bat houses near a, an elementary school. I just think it's a recipe for disaster, either from a rabid bat that could occur at some point in the future that kids come in contact with, or just young bats that fall out of the roost as they are wont to do in the summertime, and then children who have a lot of empathy and not haven't been scared to death by their parents yet pick up the bat. We, we have to be careful about those things. Vandalism is a huge threat to bat houses. Um, they, are, they stick out as easy targets for shooting, for paintballing, for setting fires underneath. I've seen it all. Monitoring and management is very important with bat houses because they're generally made out of wood and they're not going to last that long and we want to know if they're effective and if not, we need to adaptively manage them. So we don't want to create a population sink. If we're proposing mitigation habitat, it needs to be as safe as, and secure as it possibly can be. It can't simply be a feel-good thing. Put up a bat house in the forest. Put up a bat house there. That isn't, that isn't thoughtful enough um, for long-term success. So here's some closing thoughts to kind of wrap it all up. Bats are an incredibly complex taxa. I said earlier, why should we expect it to be simple? Why should we think that everything is going to be straightforward? It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Uh, the taxa is a challenge just as a specialist to study because they're active at night. 
in the most demanding of, of environments. My wife is fond of telling me that she can conduct her amphibian surveys with a net, her boots, her waders, her truck, and her binoculars and lights. $500 plus her truck. I need $45,000 worth of gear to do bat surveys. It's a little unfair for her. But it is really, um, it is really true that to study bats, depending on the type of studies that you do, it can be um, very challenging. They're, they're, they're um, unique and, and interesting. They're fascinating that way. Success of just the avoidance measures is, is very dependent on the skill of the practitioner or the person making the recommendations. It's dependent on their expertise, the methods that are proposed or used, the materials that are used, super important. When you schedule the work, when is this happening? Uh, and the execution. So folks doing the work should have demonstrable qualifications and relevant experience. I was asked some years ago to evaluate the resumes of biologists who said that they were bat biologists for a very large project because we need a lot of biologists doing tree habitat assessments and then to do monitoring later down the line. And there were a lot of very interesting and creative uh, resumes where persons became bat biologists with really interesting levels of experience. That's you know something that can sometimes be difficult to tease out. Um, being on a project where some bat work is going on isn't really demonstrable. Um, being a porter hauling the mist nets isn't going to teach you much. Um, and also, I would also say that in the realm of permitting the regulatory world and CEQA, LSA work, uh, many of the skills that you learn as a graduate uh, or an undergraduate um, student uh, or researcher, the, 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 you know, the highly intensive, challenging, and difficult and rewarding um, capture techniques, mist netting and heart trapping and cave surveys and all that stuff, doesn't translate exactly to the world that we're living in. The world that we're living in is, is overlapping but different. So there are many times where you have somebody that has a tremendous amount of bioacoustic experience. They can analyze calls much better than I can. But they don't have the experience in the practical side of, of uh, CEQA execution, if you will. Um, and that's something that we need to be cognizant of, that you know, we, we need to both evaluate what other people's skill levels are, and then we as practitioners need to know that there are skills that translate and skills that don't quite. And we need to work on those skills that really translate to the work that we're proposing or doing. These measures have to be shown to be effective. I told you my goal is 100% effectiveness. I don't want take. I don't want direct mortality. That's me. Um, and I think everybody has that as their goal. I think everybody feels the same way. Uh, um, unfortunately, when you experiment with something you've never done before, has no demonstrated success, that's what it is. It's experimentation. And I think that is appropriate as an adjunct to a project. A lot of what I did on the Safe Harbor Agreement project for Townsend Spigard Bat was experimental because we knew that we had to get those bats out of the building or else they would die. So I was able to manipulate that population more than we would ever try to do otherwise. And we learned a lot of interesting things from that manipulation. But you don't want to be experimenting with things that nobody has ever done before unless you have lots of examples of things that are very much like that. Otherwise, it's just experimentation. So I, I suggest that keep in mind that you don't want to experiment when it's critical. We want avoidance of take. And I want to leave you with, and I can repeat this little video. Um, I hope I'm going to start this correctly. This is one of the bridges for which I designed bridge, excuse me, bat habitat modules. They are combination day and night roost modules, and I think I will um, move just off so I can point with the laser. Uh, 
don't look at it. <laughs> All right. So that line that goes across is the day roost crevice. The larger recess that you see is intended as night roost habitat. We'll get it. So those are all the bats that you're hearing. So I said bats have social calls, you know. We think of bats as being ultrasonic, but there's a lot of audible calls that, that bats make. But that's also mixed with the sound from the bat detector. So it's a little confusing, unless you're used to hearing those two together. That is one of, I think, 15 modules that I designed and installed on this bridge. So, I leave you with that just to say that it is possible to provide really effective replacement habitat. We, we want to make sure that we don't rule that out because we have a misperception that that can't reasonably be done. That actually resulted in an increase in the number of bats using the bridge, the original bridge, and an increase in the number of species using the bridge. And we actually picked up Antrozoas pallidus there that weren't using it previously because I had done all the baseline work there. So that's, that's it. Anybody have any questions? <laughs>